everyone. We are very happy to see you all here. And we appreciate everyone who will see our film and get feelings and message from it. And uh, what happened with Atija? This is usually the last question, but we will start with this here. Uh, so this journey was very long for all of us. We didn't know how far it will take us. And we just all went to that ship and keep <laughs> moving. And uh, one of the first very important stops for us was the Sarajevo Film Festival, where we gave assembly of material. So it wasn't even a rough cut. It was after one year of shooting, where we still didn't know what we have. We were five people in the team. That's all the judgment we had. Like we were not objective towards our material. Like, is it really like what we think it is? Is it such a great material? So Sarajevo Film Festival gave us the first ap approval of what we have and uh, gave us the chance to say thank you to our protagonist, which is Atijan. And uh, they awarded us with 30,000 euros from the Turkish National Television, it's an annual award. And with this, we actually, we bought her a house in the next village, close to her brothers, which is the village of Torfulia. So now she's in the process of moving and she's constantly going back and forth taking care of her bees and uh, starting the process of moving to, to be close to her brothers, obviously. Uh, but uh, one very important thing is that even though we continued the shooting after Sarajevo Film Festival, we stopped the film where we stopped it because we didn't want to, to give a like, happy ending to it or give a some kind of feeling that, okay, you know, like what happened to her, that she moved, that she has a happy life now. For us, it was important to see her, that she's handling the life she has. And this is important for everyone. Like, sometimes you get more, but sometimes you just have to deal with what you have, and that's it. And you have to find the smallest happiness just there, not to hope for more. So that's why we ended the film as we did. So she is still doing uh, her beekeeping then. That was yes. the other question I was going to ask you. The only thing I wanted to ask, I couldn't find anything online about, was initially the idea, and this is your second documentary that you made with the same team of, of people. Six six people? Two cinematographers? Five. Five, okay. And one sound designer who came in Highland later. One sound one designer, designer. okay. Uh, people, you know, documentary filmmaking is expensive. I mean, it just, I wondered initially, the money you're saying about the money that you, you got awarded but when you were looking around Lugo for a place and looking for an environmental story where does money come in at all about that i wonder because it's different for everybody okay it's a complicated question this film is not uh, funded regularly like like coverage documentary of this kind no, just like this. You could. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> we, well, we were finishing our previous film, yeah. uh, which was very different from Hamlet. Uh, we were commissioned at the beginning from the Nature Conservation mm -hmm. Project, which is a Swiss uh, project, Swiss Agency of Development, in uh, the central part of. Uh, our country and we were commissioned to produce a video because we were working before uh, you know, on smaller project, projects with them uh, about the research for a possible documentary short documentary about the area from some environmental perspective and we started with that research and soon we found the bees and the bee holes and that each other it was clear that that would be our uh, subject. So we, at first, we tried to expand the, the production, very small scale, uh, in the frames of the project, which the, with those money we we finished after three years. And uh, after the post production, we applied to. National Film Agency, and 
attend to a couple of other pubs, some of them in San Francisco. Uh, still. I thought San Francisco yes. had something to do with it. Is there anything else that you'd like to say before I open this to the audience? That will be shortly about the next Okay. So if anybody has a question right off, I'll come up to you at the microphone. Anybody have a question? Okay. Right into the Hi, how did you find her? How did you find her? And how are you able to get so close? She seemed uh, to not be connected with filmmakers. So how did you? Uh, and she seemed to not. Uh, she seemed to be completely authentic and not looking at or acknowledging the person or two or three who had to be right there near her in a very intimate way. I was just curious. How did you find her? And, how are you able to get that? So for us, uh, it's it's very nice to remind ourselves so every time that actually the piece brought us to her. How we like to think about it because uh, at the beginning we had to make a research about this area and what this area had and to find the right topic. So it wasn't necessarily the bees or her. So as we started this research and exploring, uh, we first found the beehives. And through the beehives, when we started asking around, what are these, who made them, we came to her. So from there, everything started and we learned so much in the process. We didn't know anything about it. I got one also. When Van Gogh was a young man, he worked with the potato eaters and the people in the rural districts in Holland. And I was really struck by the way in which the imagery in the film resembled so much some of the scenes that were in those paintings by Van Gogh. So I just wonder if, if that was an influence upon you doing that in doing the cinematography. Not really, but we used to say that for example, uh, Vermeer, so because it looks like Vermeer's paintings somehow. But it also depends. It is we are talking about the, what we see inside. Uh, you know, her mother for those scenes where it is lighting. The scenes with the with the, the family are very different from that. So depends. I have a question back here. He's asking, what is the name of the town or the village that she was in? The Kirlia is the village, and now the other village, the bigger village, where she's moving is Dorfulia. They are uh, between the persons. Uh, not where, where is the uh, central Macedonia, between the towns of uh, Beles and Stupin. He's saying how how far? Is that what you're asking? Or how far from Skopje? From Skopje. It is a relative because it is some 70, 75 kilometers, but to get there you need four hours. I just have two questions. Um, one, how long did the filming take from when you started? I don't mean uh, uh, in the editing, but in the actual filming, was it a year and a half, three years? three quarters of a year and just sort of as a passive curiosity do you have any idea what made the uh, cattle so sick? Thank you. Uh, we were filming uh, three years 100 filming day, days spread in, in three years um, plus death of the mother was the fourth year fourth year and uh, what the second question, what was the title of the cups? Uh, depends on the year, I don't know the English name. Uh, it is, um, sometimes it is a disease which is with structures like this on the skin of. And sometimes it's other disease, but it is usual in. Uh, most of the Balkans, once per year, there are 
ça se met plus avec deux éditions. Any questions? The family that moved in, did they just happen to fall into your lap in, in terms of filming? I mean, it just, it just so happened that these people moved in and this whole epic uh, occurred? No, we fell in their store because they are nomads. They come every year there. Oh, they do. lives there. So after six months of being there, we discovered that they're coming. And from Atiji we found out their story, their past, and their conflicts. Oops. And it was a very difficult decision whether we'll start working with them, start approaching them, or just keep, stay with Atiji. So they kept returning to that area? They keep returning to that area? So we are filming, we are showing in the film one year cycle, we are filming there three years. So we catch most of the things at least twice. So they realized what they did to her economy. They have many conflicts. Another question that I had was around the, uh, something that I saw I think in an interview on YouTube was that as documentary filmmakers, I know that most people try to stay out of the story as much as possible and that they're Tell me if I'm wrong, I think there were two occasions where you felt kind of compelled. One was when the young girl looked like she was going to drown. Was that something? How did you how did you wait on that as long as you did? And, and obviously you didn't intervene, but I wondered how that affected you and any decisions to Well, this is obviously a different answer for both uh, being co directors. But one thing is very important. Once you start a process of documentary filmmaking, you must resolve this question with yourself before you start the shooting. How much are you willing to uh, step over the red line? And what does this mean for you? What is the red line? For us, uh, for, it's a good thing that we agreed about this. And it was our second film, so we knew how we were working this. Uh, so, for us, the red line is not to make the protagonists do something out of their comfort zone. So this is something that they always do. This always happens, either we're there or not. That girl is swimming every day, she has like three out of five chances of being drowned, and this is her parents' uh, responsibility. We are not there as a charity organization, we are there as filmmakers, as messengers. So. This is something very important. If you're not ready to take this step, then you just don't make documentaries. That's it. We had a lot of uh, <coughs> conflicts or discussions with uh, the cinematographers and later with the editor because uh, they were they were not they were uh, not comfortable with some. Of about the particular scenes of the drowning or the death of the mother or when the little baby was beaten or the dozen of scenes which are not in the film. <laughs> uh, it's a decision for sure. For example, the baby at the scene when the little girl was drowning. So the cinematographer who was filming that was some 40 meters can't hear downstream. They can't hear you. Uh, cinematographer was some 40 meters downstream. I was <clears throat> on the left of the frame where with the parents of the girl. I saw that the girl was drowned for sure one more second because on the second second, on the second second, right, uh, the boy, one of the boys took her out of the water. But for sure that Everybody were they were ready to jump. It's not about the situation where somebody, someone's life is in danger. But uh, in every other situation, it was not our job to intervene. We offered Tatiche, for example, for the mother for the wound. The mother didn't want to do anything with herself. That's her will. 
Okay. So the red line is basically not making the protagonist do something that's out of their comfort zone. Whatever they do, naturally they will do in front of the camera. That's it, you'll find that. So it was three years, about 400 hours of, of material. You had over 100 days of footage. What was the most difficult in that year's time? What was the most difficult uh, filming and getting material? You cannot answer is it right or is it wrong? Because the situation I can explain was we were in the advanced uh, stage of editing and uh after call us uh more long and show where she can get the <coughs> signal. Uh, and during a period of I don't know two weeks we, we were aware that Mother is going worse and worse, and she must die soon. And one day she calls us. <coughs> She's dying. And uh, we went there. We didn't have a terror vehicle at that time, and so we were by car to the one village and from the other barefoot. And we get there around midnight <coughs> at the snow. And they were in the backyard, some five or six of her relatives, her brothers, and their sons or whatever, around the fire. And they were pretty much hostile when we came. What are we doing there when we came? But uh, Tija wanted, she, she was aware that uh, it, it's a part of her story. And she took us on the hand, put us inside just to that moment. I, you know, it's interesting, I didn't actually mean emotionally, but you just went somewhere, thank you very much for that answer. I should have qualified technically, I was talking, I meant, I meant technically in those three years, what was the most difficult um, time to shoot, months, seasons, uh, the natural light, I wonder if you had issues about the lighting or anything like that. Well, the nights were very difficult at the beginning. We didn't have the good camera for the night shooting. Obviously, we didn't have any light, any extra light, because there was no electricity. So after that, we tried to solve this problem by a little bit better camera than that one that can catch night light better. Winter was also difficult, just difficult to get there, to physically get there. Many times we found each other, like we, we found each other stuck, stuck in the snow. We have a lot of videos of this. <laughs> I remember. Uh, one time we got stuck, Miljuba and uh, Samir, the, one of the cinematographers, in the middle of nowhere, everything was just white, and our car was stuck in a bush. So no bag, no board, nothing. And we tried to pull ourselves out with a pocket knife <laughs> and like this on a video. So at that time, everyone thought we were crazy and what we were doing. Nobody knew why we were so long there, what we were doing. But it paid off in the end, I guess. I mean, to me, the footage uh, towards the end of the, in the winter time was, for me, it was the most effective, the most beautiful, translucent and all that. I wondered if you had a similar feeling about certain parts of the film too, where you look at that and you go, "We nailed it," you know. The winter, <laughs> the same, the same. Does anybody else have uh, another one, and then I'll come to you. Were the nomads um, antagonistic towards you about filming them, or, or were they hostile? 
hospital in the beginning and got used to it. Um, and the other question I have is whether the protagonist was compensated during the filming at all. Okay. Uh, the second family we started first they appeared half year after we started with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we needed half more year maybe to get close to them. Uh, it was not easy uh, because that teacher was was close with the with the children. She were coming in for better or at the top. Uh, we tried to get close through them. So we first I tried uh, with, uh, with the kids and then slowly get close to the mother and mother. And I will tell you the situation when I personally got on or when they got relaxed with us is uh, because we had one small uh, lava new vehicle and we were going twice, me and uh, cinema, one of the cinema directors first, with the equipment and food. And then she was going back <coughs> to the next village to pick up some other time or problem. And once he bring me there with, with food and uh, without food, only with equipment, and go and went back for them and their storm starts. And they went to Skopje and I stayed there for 45 days with them. And for me personally, that was the moment when, when they got totally relaxed. That uh, scene with me and uh, with Atiju also. Uh, that scene with the swing is filmed during. And about the second question, uh, Yes, we bought them first, uh, we give them our therapy vehicle later. We are helping the kids every year. We started a campaign. You can check it on our website, Canada kind of Uh We are renovating their house in Dufuria, the winter house. And uh, all the other refrigerators or some other. We are trying to compensate for both sides. Was it difficult uh, filming the bees and were you ever stung or? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get stuck because uh, luckily we started shooting without each other. If we got if we, if we started shooting with the other family, we would be proud now, yeah. but not here. <laughs> uh, my question for you is uh, who did the editing? It was marvelous editing. And the second question is. Did you ever give them any food? I know you were trying to save their integrity, but you must have been able to share food with them at some point. We cooked together, all of us. Like there was one fireplace, a lot of stones, so we were just uh, around them, <laughs> eating together. That's the first rule in documentary filmmaking: you must eat with your protagonist. We're sleeping in tents in her backyard. So. Okay. We're sleeping in tents in her backyard. Oh. No. And, and what about the editing? Athanas Georgiev is the editor. I'm sorry? Athanas Georgiev. Excellent. She's also our producer. Mm -hmm. I was wondering <coughs> how you uh, got her to agree to do this. Was it difficult? And she was, she didn't seem aware of the cameras, which was quite remarkable, considering that she was a very isolated woman in general. I just was stunned at how that could have happened. 
Well, I think one thing is clear about Natija. You can see that on the first sight you meet her. She's a natural born star. <laughs> but, uh, she's just someone who was trapped somewhere she doesn't belong. <laughs> but uh, for us, when we came, she, from the first time, basically told us that uh, it was her dream that one day some journalist shoot her while she was walking on the hills. And she doesn't make a difference between journalists and filmmakers. But for this woman, it's, it's a miracle to meet her. Even until today, after four years spent with her, we still can't, cannot explain how is it possible in a completely dead world, where not even cats move, <laughs> that she has the most enthusiasm you can see in any living human. <laughs> and uh, probably this is just a natural phenomenon <laughs> in this religion. And it was very easy to work with her, because she was all into it. She wanted to tell her story. It was completely different with the other family, obviously. <laughs> much more natural process for documentaries <laughs> they need to struggle to come to the protagonist. But for Atija, uh, one thing she said when she had one interview was that uh, when, when they asked her, how did they find you? She said, I found them, they didn't find me. <laughs> so that says about everything. Something that struck me was realizing that you do not speak Turkish or or understand it, I guess, either. And that the woman who asked the question about editing, I also was blown away by that, and then learned, and tell me if I'm wrong, that your first cut, which took about six months, I think, of editing, you did on mute with no sound, and that you actually thought about releasing the film with no talking, I guess, so that anybody would understand what was going on. Since you had that thought, and then you got the transcription, uh, the transcribers came in and you saw that and then got back to the editing board, right? Would you still now consider releasing that film with just maybe a music background and no subtitles and, or anything? You said everything. What's that? You said it very nicely. You said everything. I would love to see that. For me, if it wasn't for the mother, I would consider releasing it without subtitles. <laughs> She's for me the most, the most experienced uh, screenplay writer. <laughs> oh um, okay, you've asked a couple of questions. Any, any new people here? So you, you mentioned interviews, and I was actually curious as to why. Normally, the main documentary is either interviews with the camera or narration to kind of leave the audience along with the story and sort of give context to what's happening. But here you just, just observational and, and don't really leave the audience by the hand at all. Uh, but I wonder how you came to use that style or why you chose it. Why we choose it is the question. Right, yeah, yeah. Not, not to use interviews and narration to kind of guide the story. Mm -hmm. Andrew, fiction should look like a documentary to pretend to closer to the documentary and the documentary should be like fiction. So uh, it was very easy but it was not enough far far from satisfying to make an interview with that gem. Should tell the story. We made it but just with information. I would add something more to that. When you do a longer time, or you work on documentaries for a longer time, you can see this as, like, there's levels in a game. The first level is interviews. That's the easiest. The second is narration. And the third is when you just go, go and go and further on, and you realize you don't need narration because it's all there in the material, so. Thank you. I a couple of questions. Uh, well, actually, just thank you for the film. I really, the, there was such touching dialogue between the mother and the antigen. That's, that's her name. One question I have is uh, the whether she's seen the film, wanted to see the film, and her thoughts about it. 
chase him to film and also the other thing that makes me see him to film. And they have different, different thoughts about it. <laughs> Let's give these people a really round of applause. 